So the dot product there in the first one multiplies all of the components of a vector together that are parallel, okay? And if two vectors are perpendicular, they'll be zero. The second one does a cross product. What it does is multiplies all the perpendicular parts of a vector together. If you have two vectors that are parallel, then your cross product will be zero because they have no parts that are perpendicular to multiply together, okay? So, if we just assume that first upside down triangle, we call it the Bell operator. We just assume it's some vector. You don't even have to know what it is, but it's kind of like a, a, a slope type of, of thing. It calculates like a slope. But if we have that and we cross it with the electric field and we know that any two vectors that are parallel when we do the cross product, we get zero. What does that tell you about that upside down triangle Bell and that vector E, which is our electric field? What does that tell you about that? They are what? Anytime you do a cross product of two vectors that are parallel, you get zero. So what does that tell you about those two vectors? They're parallel. They are parallel. And anytime you have two vectors that are parallel, say this is del, let's pretend. That's del. And then we have some other vector E that's parallel to it. Isn't it true that I can just say that, I can just say that E or, or basically I can say del, this vector here, that they are just going to equal some scaled version of each other. Does that make sense? So in other words, if I multiply this del vector times, not dot product, but times some scalar, I'm just gonna call it a V for now, some scalar, I can make it equal E. I can just make it longer or shorter. Like say E was twice the length of del. I make V2 and suddenly they're the exact same vector. Do we agree with that? If two vectors are parallel, there has to exist some scalar that I can scale one of them by to get to the other one. If, it, if, it's a, if we want it to become longer, we multiply that scalar has to be a, a, a number greater than one. If we want it to become shorter and scale down, it has to be a number less than one. If we want it to be anti-parallel, it's a negative number, right? So we agree with this? So what this is telling us is that we can represent, uh, essentially, we can represent, we can take this electric field and we can come up with some sort of scalar that will match it. That del thing there, that upside down triangle, is a constant. It never changes. It's, a, it's, it's an operator. All right, it's an operator. It never changes. So what that, this is essentially telling us is we can get some sort of scalar out of this electric field, okay? And when we operate this del onto that V, what it essentially tells us is a slope. It tells us something called a gradient. Any of you taken calculus? Remember doing slopes? This is essentially like a three-dimensional slope. It tells us the direction that V is changing the fastest, increasing the fastest, I should say. All right. So how in the world do we get a scalar from a from a vector? We have so we have this room filled with an electric field, vectors everywhere. How is it that we can have all the exact same information? Because del itself is a constant, it unchanged, which means all of the information in that vector field is contained inside that scalar. Doesn't seem like that should happen, does it? Because what do scalars lack that vectors have? Direction. But we can still represent our entire vector field, all of our tons and tons of vectors with just scalars, all right? And the reason we wanna do this is because scalars are much easier to work with. Now, how in the world do we do this? Well, the electric field is telling you how a vector is pointed. If we simply look at a scalar field and we look at the direction it's increasing the most, suddenly that adds back on that direction for us. So that's kind of how we're doing it. What you're gonna to wanna to think of is you're gonna to wanna to think of this voltage, this V that I used here, this, this scalar as elevation and the electric field as how steep something is. So the electric field is telling us how much it's changing, whereas the voltage is telling what level we're at at that moment. 
So as we go through, I want to encourage you to kind of think of it that way. You can't just have a single voltage at a single point and then tell me what the electric field is. You have to have the voltage at all the points around it to determine which direction it's changing the most. And then that's the direction that the electric field is pointing, except reversed. Because we do, do, we do one more thing here. By convention, we add a negative sign. And we add that negative sign just to give preferential treatment to positive charges. And then as we move on, I'll, I'll come back to that and show you exactly what I mean, why that negative sign gives preferential treatment to positive charges. All right, so what is this scalar thing we're looking at? What in the world is it? Well, it's called voltage, right? This V is called voltage. Voltage or electric potential, or sometimes people just call it potential, all right? Scalar potential, names like that, all right? So maybe a slash. It has units of a volt. So units, and interesting, unit is a volt, which is just a capital V. So the unit is the same as the symbol. Be very careful you don't mix the two up. Pay attention to context. If it's written right after a number, it's probably the unit. If it's written in an equation, it's probably the variable for voltage. And so one of the things I have found with this is that most people really don't understand what this is. I, I mean, I've met people in grad school for physics seem to totally lack an understanding of what voltage actually is. So part of it is in the name, electric potential. You might go to the store and you're looking at something, say maybe you want to buy like a vacuum cleaner or something, they're like, oh, this one's 120 volts, or this one's 200 volts, or you need one of those little, you know, those little stun gun things, little taser things, and they're like, this one is 30,000 volts, right? No, this one's 100,000 volts. Well, so what? What is that actually telling you? Is that telling you the amount of power it has? No. No. Voltage is not the amount of power you have. Voltage doesn't tell you how dangerous something is. You could shock yourself on something that's 100 volts and get killed and get shocked by something that's 100,000 volts and be just fine. Okay? So what is this voltage telling you? Well, I'm going to ask you a question first here. Let's say that I was standing in one room and The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is standing in another room. Who's lifting more weight, me or The Rock? Now, obviously you wanna say me, right? Okay, obviously, okay? And you say this because of how, you know, massive and muscly I am, right? Or not. Obviously, if you had to pick, he could lift more weight than me, right? But if I asked you the question, who is lifting more weight? What's your answer? Huh? No, no, we, we're just in rooms. Who's lifting more weight? Not our own weights. Huh? Why neither of us? How do you know that? Well, see, that's the total point, right? You don't know, do you? He could be in a room and have absolutely no weights to lift. I could be in this room over there with a five pound little dumbbell that I'm picking up. In which case, who's lifting more weight? Me, right? Who could lift more weight? The Rock, okay? I mean, we've never had a competition, but I'll give it to him. I think he probably could lift a little more than me, right? But if the question is who is lifting more weight, we don't know. It could be me, it could be him. If the question is who could lift more weight, it's him. He has a greater potential to lift weight than I do. But that doesn't mean he actually is. This is what voltage is telling you. Voltage isn't telling you how much electric charge can be moved. It's telling, or it's not telling you how much electric charge is being moved. It's telling you how much could be moved if it was available. So this electric charge, it's your potential to move a charge. So think of it as potential to move 
a charge. It's your potential to move a charge. It's not how much charge you are moving. It's how much charge you could move if that charge was there and available for you to move. All right, your potential to move a charge, which means our voltage ends up uh, being what we'll see on the next few pages. We'll get into the equations and stuff for it. Uh, but it's our potential to move a charge, our work per unit charge. So if we look at something, and I said like, you could get shocked on something that is 120 volts, like, like in your house, right? And it could kill you. Or you could get shocked on something that's 100,000 volts and it doesn't kill you. And the reason that is, is because when they design like those stun gun things, they limit the amount of charge that they have to deliver to you, okay? So even though you're getting shocked by that, it's not enough electricity and not enough charge to actually hurt you. What happens typically is when the current, the charge goes across your heart, it can mess up your heartbeat and stop your heart from beating. That's usually the part that kills you. Well, if those little stun gun has 100,000 volts, but it doesn't have hardly any charge to do, then it hurts, but it doesn't kill you. So why would they make it such a high voltage if it doesn't actually do anything to kill you? Well, I mean, the, the main point is for those to be non-lethal. Why not make them non-lethal at 100 volts? Why make it such a high voltage? Anybody think of a reason why you'd want that to be such a high voltage if your entire purpose is to not push a lot of charge? Huh? Easier to what? Yeah, what if someone who's attacking you that you have to defend yourself, what if they're wearing a big thick jacket, right? So the 100,000 volts isn't there to move a lot of charge. It's there to move a little bit of charge very well. All right, so you can still shock them even if you know, you're not getting it right on their skin or something like that, okay? So that's what this electric potential, that's what this voltage is. It's like a slope to us. It's like, uh, or, or the electric field is like a, a slope to us. It's like a difference in elevation, right? Okay, how steep something is. That's what we're trying to think of here. It's your potential to move something, not how much is actually being moved. If I walk over to a really steep slide, right? Really steep slide that's very tall, I can say that has a great potential to get someone to slide down it really fast, especially compared to a very small little slide that isn't very steep, right? It doesn't mean someone's on there actually doing it right now, but they have the potential to let someone slide down it faster. Okay, so let's take a look at, does that make any sense at all about the idea of it's the potential to move a charge, not actually how much charge you're moving? All right, voltage can often be an indication of how dangerous something is, right? But if it's current limited, if the amount of charge is limited, then it really just tells you how much it's going to hurt and not really necessarily kill you. All right, you got to know more than that. It's actually power equals voltage times current, but we're not there yet. All right, so the electric force is a conservative force. Basically, that's telling us we can represent it with a scalar voltage, which we just did on the last section. Therefore, there must be a potential energy associated with it. It takes work to move an electric charge perpendicular to uh, an electric field. And that's our work. Work equals negative QED. Charge times the strength of the electric field times the distance that we're moving it through the electric field. This should be parallel. Parallel have two R's, P-A-R-R, P-A-R-A-L-L. -L. Oh, I need to tell them they wrote the wrong word there. That should be parallel. If you're moving it parallel to an electric field, it takes work. If you move it perpendicular to an electric field, it doesn't take any work. All right. So as typical, the change in potential energy is the negative of the work. So potential energy is just QED. All right. QED. So this is the amount of work it takes 
to move a charge. Now, voltage, we're going to define as, I said it was the potential to move a charge. So we're going to say it's the work or potential energy per unit charge. So that means that our voltage is potential energy per unit charge or negative work per charge. The unit for this is again the volt, which I showed, which I told you on the previous page, and it is a joule per coulomb. Joule for work, the scalar work, and per coulomb for charge. Joule per, joule per coulomb. Lastly, on this page, we're going to define a new, maybe you've seen it before in chemistry or something, a new unit of energy. It's a unit of energy called the electron volt. It is quite literally the charge, the elementary charge times one volt, which gives you 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Because a volt is a joule per coulomb. So when you multiply it by a charge, you end up with just an energy. So it's an electron volt. Very important that you know that. It's a nice, easy to use unit, especially when you're talking about little point charges. We're talking about electrons and protons and things like that. Okay? But an electron volt is a unit of energy, not a voltage. Not uh, anything else. It's, a, it's an energy. Okay? Here, the electric field is related to how fast the potential is changing. That's what me telling you about the slope. All right? The quicker your elevation is changing, the steeper your hill is, the greater your electric field is. The faster your voltage is changing, the greater your electric field is. The faster it's going to accelerate something, right? Just like we talked about with the slide, a really steep slide has a greater, the long steep slide has a greater potential than a short, you know, almost horizontal slide to move something really fast. That greater potential, okay? Huh? Distance. The further you move through the field. Okay. Now, how do we use this with uh, moving things? Well, if we're inside a conservative force, moving from point A to point B, moving an object in general, is its kinetic energy plus its potential at the first point has to equal its kinetic energy at the second point plus its potential energy at the second point, right? This is just like the old drop a ball, see how fast it's going at different heights as it falls, right? You, you combine the conservation of energy, conservation of mechanical energy here. But in this place, Instead of using something like MGH for gravitational potential energy, we're going to use the electric force, Q times V. So remember, voltage was work per charge with a negative sign, right? And work is negative potential energy, or I should say negative change in potential energy per charge. And so our potential energy is just Q times V. Now, we're not writing a delta in front of it here because technically voltage is always delta V. It's always a change of voltage. It doesn't make sense to talk about the voltage at a single point without first defining a zero point. If I ask you the elevation of the top of a mountain, what kind of a measurement would you give me? above sea level. Why above sea level? It's zero, right? We set that as zero, correct? And then we measure from that. So all of our heights, all of our gravitational potential energies, they were all relative to some zero point we set, right? And you usually pick some zero point that made it easiest. Like if you take your ruler and I want to know the length of this desk, I don't just set it on here like this, you know, I usually 
move one end over here. So I start off with zero and all I have to do is read the number on the other side, right? If I put it on here randomly, then I have to like measure over and find, oh, this is 3.2 and you know, whatever this is and then do subtraction. So you usually make it something easy. You set a zero point where you need. Since this is a potential energy per charge, we also have to do that here. You have to set a zero point. So I can't just say this spot is eight volts. I have to tell you relative to what? It's eight volts relative to this spot over here that's zero, okay? So you have to know what it's relative. You have to set a zero point. So V is always delta V. It's always change in V. We just get lazy with it and just start writing V once we've defined a zero. And then you can just go through and solve for whatever you need to, uh, like what the change, what would be the change in speed as something moves through an electric field. So if we put a charge in an electric field and say we started it off and it was sitting stationary, this would be zero. Q times VA, the change in voltage between those two would then be equal to the kinetic energy change. And you could solve for how fast it's going. Okay. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Since here's the part I was talking about where we give the, that negative sign gives us a nice preference to positive charges. Since the force on a negative charge is opposite to the field direction, okay? Positive charges accelerate in the direction of decreasing potential energy, which is the direction of the electric field. So if the electric field is pointing to my right, y'all's left, then that means that's actually the direction that the potential, the voltage is decreasing, okay? Because that's why we chose that negative sign. And then that, what that does is it tells us that if we put a positive charge in an electric field and it, we just let it move according to how the electric field would move it, it's both its potential energy and its electric potential then is, move, is decreasing. And I shouldn't say the charge is electric potential. It really, the electric potential is that of the electric field, but it's moving in the direction that the electric potential is decreasing. And so therefore is also the same direction that it's potential energy is decreasing. That's where we give that preference to positive charges. For negative charges, they are going to accelerate in the direction of increasing electric potential. In other words, they're gonna accelerate opposite to the electric field, which is the direction that the voltage is increasing. And that's also then the direction that the negative charges, potential energy is decreasing. So you have to be very careful with this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, we'll get there. So a lot of people are very meticulous about this mathematically. They wanna keep track of every little negative sign and stuff like that. I, I don't know, I, I, I don't like to do that. I feel like it's too many negatives when you start having in directions and you move stuff around and it's a lot of negatives to keep track of. You need to ask yourself a question. If you wanna know, whether or not this is true gravitationally or electrically. If you want to know whether or not something's potential energy is increasing or decreasing, you just need to ask yourself if it's doing what it would want to do without any outside interference. If I were to let go of this pin and let it drop, as soon as I let go of it, there's no outside influence and it does what it wants to do, which is go down. That is a decrease in the gravitational potential energy of this pin. Right? It did what it wanted to do. If I take this pin and I move it upward, which is opposite of what it wants to do on its own, I have increased its potential energy. It's the same thing with electric field. If I put a charge in an electric field and just let it go and let it do what it wants to do, the positive charge goes in the direction of the electric field. The negative charge goes in the opposite direction of the electric field. That is a decrease in potential energy. So a negative charge going in the direction of the electric field decrease in potential energy. Wait, did I say negative charge? Positive charge going in the direction of an of a electric field is a decrease in potential energy. A negative charge let to go on its own will want to go in the opposite direction of the electric field. That will also be a decrease in potential energy for that. 
decrease in potential energy. Okay. The positive charge is the only one that they, then that does the decrease in electric potential that matches up with its own potential energy. So just think about whether or not something's doing what it wants to do, or if you're having to force it. If I move a, uh, a, a positive charge in the opposite direction of the electric field, I'm forcing it to go in a direction it doesn't want to go. I'm pushing it up the stream of water, like against the current. That's an increase in potential energy, like stretching the rubber band or lifting this up in the air. Okay, so if you're making it do what it's trying not to do, you're increasing potential energy. Does that make sense? Kinda, yeah, maybe, no, right? If we had a river and the river would accelerate you the whole way down it. If you're at the far end of the river and you hop in, by the time you reach the finish line, you're gonna be going a lot faster than if you hopped on halfway into the river, right? And it just sped you up the same amount the whole way. By the time you reach the end of the river, the further you started up, the faster you're gonna be going when you get to the end, right? Because you have a greater potential energy then assuming you don't reach a maximum speed, right? If you can just keep accelerating the whole time. Well, if I have something that's in the middle of the river and I push it up the river against the current, I'm increasing how fast it'll be able to be going when it reaches the end, correct? So I'm increasing its potential. It's the same thing. If I have an electric field like this, right? Electric field. And I put a positive charge right here and I move that positive charge to here I have now increased its potential energy because as soon as I let go of it, it's gonna to wanna to go back to the right, to the right, okay? If I move it, so if I move it from, if this, let's call this A, let's call this B. If I move it from B to A, that's an increase in potential energy. If I move it from A to B, it's a decrease in potential energy. In fact, if I put it at A and let go of it, it will move itself over to B. It will give up that potential energy to create kinetic energy, right? Tries to minimize that potential energy. If it was a negative charge, okay, and I moved it from B to A, would I be increasing or decreasing the potential energy? decreasing because that's the direction the electric charge, the negative charge wants to go, isn't it? It wants to go against the electric field. If I move it from A to B, is that an increase or decrease? Increase, because that's the opposite of the way it wants to go. I'd have to actually get down there and push it and force it. That's like forcing it uphill. Is this making a little more sense now when I say it that way? Okay, so that's what you have to pay attention to. Now, the voltage itself, the electric potential, doesn't care what charges are there. The voltage itself only cares here to here. So if we went through and defined this as, let's say, 10 volts, then this might be 5 volts. If we go in the direction of the electric field, that voltage is going to decrease. So what we would say is we have a potential difference between those two points of five volts. I could have made this, so I made that 10 volts, that could have been five. I could have made this, conversely, I could have called this five volts and then this would have been zero volts. I could have called this zero volts and then this would have been negative five volts, but it's always a difference of five. Do we see that? And then depending on which way you're moving, it's either a negative five or a positive five. If I move from A to B, it's a negative five. If I move from B to A, it's an increase of five. It's a positive five volt. You see that? See what I'm talking about there? That's voltage. Voltage doesn't care about which charge is there, but it gives the preference to the positive charge such that if the positive charge moves from A to B, it's a decrease in potential energy for the charge, and it also was a decrease in potential from the locations it moved. That's why I would put that negative sign there. It's just a convention, doesn't have to be there, just gives preferential treatment to positive charges. Okay, so let's go back to this picture here at the front real quick. See this one? Now, if you're looking at this, hopefully this picture makes a little more sense to you. You see those voltage lines, those are actually called lines of equipotential. 
It takes no work to move along one of those lines because the voltage is the same at every single point on, on a single one of those lines. So if I were to start with a charge right here, say I put a positive charge right here and I moved it up to here, that would require absolutely no effort on my part. It would require no work from me and no work would be done on the charge to move it from there to there because I didn't change the potential at all. And therefore there's no change in potential energy. This is a conservative field. So therefore, since this is a scalar and this is the nice thing about voltage, we only care about the start and end. So look at path D. You see the little looping around path D here? Path D. I do a certain amount of work moving it along path D, correct? What if instead I had done this? What if I had just taken it and moved it straight over to there? How would the work done moving it straight versus moving it along the, the, the swirly path of D, how would those two works compare? Be absolutely the same, right? Absolutely the same. All that matters is the beginning and the end, just like with potential energy. All that matters is our change in it. So it's path independent because we have that nice conservative field. All right? So that's what they're showing you in this picture. They're trying to show you all the different paths. Doesn't really matter. All that matters is where you start, where you end. All right, one more question for you. Ready? This one's, let me see if you can answer this one. Let's say I have a positive charge right here. And I move this positive charge to here. And I pay attention to how much force it takes me to push it and everything like that in the distance. And I, I, I calculate how much energy it took me to do. Now I take that same positive charge and I move it up to here. How, do the, how does the total energy or the total work I had to do in those two different paths compare? Same. And if you wanted to think of it a different way, you could move this to here and you could move that up to there. This part would have a work of zero. In which case, in other words, we can get to here from there without doing any more work. So their works, the total work you have to do or the work you have to do against it, exactly the same. All right, let's get back to where we were. I hate this. I feel like I'm rushing because I really feel like I could spend days and days and days talking about this. Huh? I should. <laughs> Maybe I'll put out, uh, I think I have an old video I did where I really explained this a lot more deeply. And I could put that. You just want, you just want to delay the test. Uh, all right. The electric potential of point charges. So we already, we were just talking about this is work per unit charge. That's our voltage, which means if we just multiply our voltage by by uh, Q, we get that back. So what you can see here is this part right here, not the Q naught part, that's your electric potential. That's your voltage at a single point. If you then multiply that voltage times the charge that you put at that point, you suddenly have the potential energy. All right, so remember voltage is work per charge which is U delta U per charge. So delta U is just Q times V, our change in voltage. And remember, v, every V is a delta V, whether you write it or not, it's a delta V. And that's what we have here. We have change in potential energy is equal to Q times our change in voltage. Okay? You can also remember this way, work equals negative Q E D. This is negative Q. So we can, we can rearrange this and we can say negative work over Q is E D, which is voltage is E times D. And electric field is K Q uh, over R squared times essentially instead of, you know, the distance we move it, I guess I maybe should have put it instead of an R, we'll put a, 
I don't know. Do you want me to make the R into a D or the D into an R? And that cancels out. We end up with just a one over R instead of an R squared. So notice that here with the electric potential, the voltage, it's one over R, not one over R squared. So quick question for you. Why in the world are we going through all this? Why do we do this? Why, why wouldn't we just stick with electric fields? Very good, because scalars are a whole lot easier to work with than vectors. All right, this is ultimately just a math trick, right? We just decided we could express one thing as a scale of another, and suddenly it opened up this door where we could work entirely in scalars and then just convert back to vectors when we needed to. That's why we're doing this. Okay. And so anyway, as we move something from point A to point B, we will get that change in potential energy. In other words, it's a change in, it's just the change in voltage times whatever the charge is you just moved. Okay. That's this part right here. Electric potential of point charges. See, there it is. What I just told you, it's V equals KQ over R. That's that E times D. KQ over R. You can see it there for a picture for positive charges, for negative charges. Okay. Electric potential. Yep. Where? Here? This is not. So, all right, let's put it this way. This charge here would create an electric potential like this. This charge creates this scalar field for every location R around it. Okay, so it's like a, it's a whole big mess of numbers at every single possible point, scalar numbers, all right? So we have some sort of scalar number that appears right here and another scalar number that appears right here. And we haven't even put in charge Q naught yet. All we have is just that plus Q there, okay? Now we take and we put in charge Q naught and we put it right here at location A, and then we move it to location B. We look at that change in voltage, multiply it by what the, by what the charge Q naught is. We don't even care about the plus, we don't, even, we don't even have to worry about looking at that one anymore. We look at how much the voltage changed between there, delta V, we multiply it by Q, and we've got the amount of work it took us to move it. That's what we're doing here. whatever charge we're looking at. It could be any charge. The voltage that is created by this plus Q here doesn't care what charge you're going to put there. Now, putting different charges there will change the amount of work. For example, these are two positive charges, right? So that means that the work being done moving this, the work done, well, it depends because it depends. Is it the work done by you or the, or the work done by it, by the field? The work done by the field here is positive because this field will apply a force in that direction and the distance that this moves is also in that direction and work equals force times distance, right? They're both positive, therefore that is a positive work done by that electric field there. Say that again? Yes. There is also another electric field created by Q naught, but we're not looking at it. We're not looking at how Q naught affects Q. We're looking at how Q affects Q naught. So we could pretend like we took a hammer and nail and we, you know, we, we stuck or we stuck it on some, what's that thumbtack stuff you put posters up on the wall with, right? We stuck some and we stuck Q naught right there in that spot, it can't move. But, or Q, we stuck Q there, it can't move. Q naught's free to move. What's it gonna do? This is what it's gonna do. So. It'll do that on its own. So that would be positive work done by that electric field because the force that it's pushing and the displacement are in the same direction. Now, let's change this around. 
let's make that a negative charge. Now, if that's a negative charge, the force of the electric field is actually pointed back toward Q. It'll wanna go towards Q. So if we were to reach in and grab it and manually move it from A to B, the work done by that electric field would be negative. Okay, the work done by the electric field would be negative. The work done by us, negative or positive. We're, we reached down, grabbed Q naught at A and pushed it out to B. Is the work we did negative or positive? Yeah. Ooh, see, this is a tricky question, isn't it? If you can get this one answered right, you're probably pretty good with work. You have to be very careful. Work done on, work done by, these are, these are different things. So let's, let me give you an example here. I take my pen, I hold it in my hand, I move it up into the air. The work done by me on this pen is positive. The force I applied to the pen was up, and the, four, and the direction it moved were up. I did positive work on the pen. What about gravity? As I move this up, the force that gravity is applying to it is down, but it's moving up. They are in opposite directions. A negative times a positive is negative. Gravity did negative work. If I lower this down, the work done by gravity, by the field, is now positive. It moved down. And the, gravi and, the dire and the direction of displacement was down. But the work done by me, I'm still doing work because my hand is still applying a force to this, right? A normal force. If my hand wasn't there, this would just fall. My force that I'm applying to it is up. The displacement is down. I've just done negative work on it. All right. It's a lot easier to pay attention to than what direction is something if it's doing what it wants to do versus doing what it doesn't want to do, whether or not the force is in the same direction or opposite direction for positive or negative work. Okay. Uh, we had that. Um, here, it's just a diagram showing the electric potential at different places. And again, the slope of that's going to tell us how strong the electric field is. And then here, look at this topo topographical map. Each one of these little one of these little lines tells you a certain elevation, right? If I were to let's say release a bunch of uh, like I don't know uh, carts or something that can roll downhill or balls or something, right? All right, and I released them all from this very top part, and I let them each go a different direction down this down there. Which ones are going to move the fastest? So I, I, I put one here and I let it go that way. I put one here, I let it go that way. Put one here, let it go that way, that way, that way. Which ones are gonna start going the fastest? Can you tell that just from this picture? This one over here? Yeah, why? Because you can tell it's steeper there, right? It's gonna, now by the time they all reach the bottom, assuming there's no friction, they should all be going the same speed, but this one's gonna reach the bottom by far the fastest. So if we let this one go, like say this was 10 meters and we let this one go 10 meters and then we stop them both, this one will be going much faster than this one as a greater change in elevation. All right, these lines, these lines of equipotential energy of equal height, those are like lines of voltage. And if you'll notice, they're always going to be perpendicular to the direction that the thing's moving. All right. The electric field then is going to then be strongest over here, kind of like the gravitational change in gravitational is going to be strongest over here. Everything's going to move fastest over here. If we draw in the electric field, it's going to be perpendicular to these everywhere and strongest where they're closest together. These are lines of equipotential. What time is it? Oh. We're going to start here at lines of equipotential, but essentially moving along them takes no work. It's moving between them where you do work. All right, guys, have a good one.